I'm John Day. Um, I'm a tech lead here at Habu. And this talk is on applying concepts from functional programming to OOP, as well as just what I've learned along the way from um, learning both paradigms of programming. Um, so first off, um, what this talk's about, it's essentially a chance to learn a bit about functional programming if you um, have never used it. Uh, it's exploring the commonality between the two um, and just looking at how we can rethink object-oriented programming with some of the patterns that are used in functional programming, essentially. Um, and it's something that I think made me a much better developer, uh, learning both. And I hope that some of this is relevant to other people. It might just be something that's relevant to me. We'll find out. So, essentially, um, from my point of view, um, they're basically just different paradigms. Um, neither is better, in my opinion. Um, I personally have been a PHP developer for 15 years, and um, we work with PHP here every day at Habu. Um, so um, this is basically a chance to learn about functional programming, as I said. So what is functional programming? It's um, a way of developing software um, through composing functions. These are often pure. Um, but secondary to this, it's also about um, reducing shared state, um, immutability, avoiding side effects, and um, you write things in a declarative way, essentially. Um, so who here has actually um, written anything using functional programming? A couple of people. I guess in JavaScript as well, it's something some people reach for. Um, yeah, so quite a few of you, um, which is good. So yeah, what this, this um, talk is not is about programming functionally in, in PHP. Um, for the most part, there's a little bit on that, but it's more about writing object-oriented programming, um, but what I've learned from being a functional programmer as well. So the topics we're going to look at are declarative programming, um, map reduce and flat map, uh, state logic segregation, which is a term I made up, um, but I couldn't find a real term, so we had to make it up. But if anyone knows the term, then tell me, and we can talk about that. Uh, immutability, uh, composition and piping, higher order functions, deferring side effects, lenses and views, and partials and currying, and also uh, the maybe uh, methodology, I guess. So, declarative programming. Essentially, this is, is declaring what you want to happen, um, not how you want it to happen. Um, it helps to reduce cognitive load, keeps code consistent and readable. Uh, it's the opposite of imperative programming, and we're going to explore it through mainly Laravel collections uh, here today. Uh, but I may also have some other examples. We'll see, I can't remember. Um, so, um, who here has actually heard of declarative programming? Quite a few, good, this is good. So, yeah, here we have two examples, um, which I meant to flip around, so imperative was at the top, but I haven't done that. So, in your imperative style, um, we're very much saying how we want this to happen, what's going to happen. There's quite a lot of cognitive load, even in this simple example. You've got to sort of parse this code quite a lot, understand what these variables mean. You've got all these intermediate variables. You've got things that are going to leak out of scope. You're mutating, and you've got to understand what's going on here. Um, whereas in your declarative style, he's doing exactly the same thing. But here, you're just saying, I need to map over this connection, this collection, sorry. We're adding one, and we want the unique values from that collection. And it's just so much more clear. And if you see this once, then you've seen it every time you understand what it means. Whereas every time you see something that's written this way, you've got to understand what the intention was and what all these variables mean. So for me, this sort of style uh, is just so much better. As I say, Laravel Collections is just amazing um, for PHP. Um, and you can now use it separately from Laravel as well. Adam told me that the other day, so stealing his tip bit there. Um, 
yeah, so if you're not using it, then I think it's just great in PHP where we have these old, uh, older functions that haven't been changed in you know, 10, 15 years, longer than that, um, like array map and array reduce, they just, they don't feel um, nice to use to me anymore. And having this kind of fluid interface there is just really nice. Um, so that is essentially declarative programming. Um, so we're going to look a bit at map reduce and um, just talk about some other functions as well that you could use. Um, so yeah, with map and reduce essentially have the same benefits for me. You've got the encapsulation of scope, they're declarative, and as I said before, that just takes less cognitive load to understand every time you see this. Um, so other than that, in, in um, like I said, with Laravel collections, it already is available to you if you're not using Laravel. And there's just so many, so many functions in there, filtering, zip, flat map. Well, some of these aren't available in here actually, but these are great functions. I don't think that you can actually do flat map, to be fair. Um, but yeah, I think it's just a, a brilliant tool. Uh, yeah, state log logic re segregation, as I said, I made that term up. Um, but essentially, in, in functional programming, you, you don't really have a choice about this. Um, you have functions, and you have something that's holding your data. In OOP, you can mix these two things together. You could have a, a massive model, um, and that model could have hundreds of functions on, if you so wish, that mutate the state and um, could act upon it or, or get you something or, or perform massive actions. Um, so I think that's where, where it becomes quite tricky to decide where am I actually putting this? Am I putting this in a model or am I putting this in the service layer? Which one are we actually using here? And so um, I used to really struggle with that. And through functional programming, I think I really started to move towards um, very thin models and no logic in them at all, just getters and setters and acting upon them. And um, I think this is, is probably something that a lot of people do. Um, but yeah, this is just something that's solidified in my brain through, through functional programming. I certainly used to write very fat models um, five or 10 years ago myself. Um, so yeah, we're gonna look at a bit of actual functional code here. So this is um, some Elixir code. So as I said, you've got this separation of, of functions and your data. So um, this is a, a struct containing five pieces of data, and we have some functions that can act upon upon that struct. So in this case, it's the uh, Mars rover robot, and we're just move, looking to move its orientation. Um, so the functions here aren't too important, but you can essentially do pattern matching in, in Elixir. So rather than having if statements, uh, this this function will be called if the orientation of the robot is is zero, and this one will be called if it's ninety. So rather than having nested if statements, um, which I think is a really nice feature, um, just to explain what's going on there. But yeah, for this more we're talking about the fact that you're actually changing the state of of that um, data through separate functions. So. Hopefully we should have an example of this in PHP as well, which we do. So here, this is probably very familiar to everyone. We have a class that's got getters and setters on it. And we've got our properties and our constructor. And we're gonna hold our data in there. As I said, you could end up putting a lot more data as well as uh, your methods in here. Um, and it's just difficult to decide where. So for me, I've started to just say this, this is just for accesses. Um, and we're always going to act upon that in a similar way to what we were talking about with the functional um, code. So we're going to have a service layer that actually adjusts the state of that. Um, and even within writing this, this particular bit of code, I had that same problem I was talking about. Where, where do you draw the line? Um, and for me here, I, I went for this robot increment y method on, on that class, which wasn't actually in, in the previous slide, but I wanted to keep that small because 
it had already got ridiculously long and it might have been a bit of a struggle to see. Um, so yeah, you just, you just end up with these, these questions of, of where do I put things? And I think that's one of the big challenges for me uh, in, in OO that um, I really like about functional programming. Um, but I think, yeah, the more that you can, unless it's mutating the state, I feel like it should be moved to the service layer. Um, so next we have immutability. Um, so in functional programming languages, pretty much every single um, thing you're working with, every bit of data, it's going to be immutable and you're always going to be receiving a copy of this. Um, and you're never mutating state, you just can't do this. And I think that's another thing that's really um, helped me when I've, I've come to object-oriented programming, trying to think about where you can use immutability and um, how it applies to PHP. It's a little bit difficult because in those languages you've got, um, it's built in. If you change anything, then that's, that's not a mutation. You get a, getting a copy of it and they have um, algorithms in place and data structures in place that allow for this to be done very efficiently. And in PHP, I think for the most part, if you try and mimic this, then you could end up um, using a lot of memory in certain situations. So you kind of have to think about it uh, quite carefully if you actually want to change the state of something in a, in a mutable way. Um, so from this, I was more thinking about um, when you can use immutability when you, you don't want to change state so much of something. Um, so for me, that was really um, things like this. So date time immutable is a great class in the, the standard library of PHP, where if, if you aren't going to mutate that date, then you can use date time immutable. And then if anything does change, if you try to change anything, it's just impossible. So you know that date is fixed. And um, I was trying to think of a good example of that um, earlier. And I thought of a birthday, but I thought you might need to change the birthday because you got it wrong. But I'm sure we've all written something where, where you knew the date was, was fixed. Um, maybe our MOT example, actually, from what we were doing in our coding test, the MOT date of a car, that, that's not going to change if you're receiving that. And if it is being changed, then you know that is, is going to be a bug. So I think that's a great class um, to use. And here we also have this um, car detail class where even if we weren't using date time immutable, then we haven't provided a setter for this class. So you know that this, this cannot be changed once, once the data is in here. Um, there is no way for you to mutate that. So I think that's, that's kind of where um, this idea of immutability I've applied to object orientation. But I started thinking about it more. And then there was a few other places that I could think of. And again, that was um, some of some of the things you get in Laravel. So Laravel strings and Laravel collections um, is a perfect example of this. So here we have um, yeah, the use of Laravel string helper. Um, we're going to use the trim function and apply it to a variable just called first. We've got second and third as well. So if we vote up out first, we can see it's an object and it's got a value of uh, high taboo. We then replace the T with an H and dump out the second one and we get high taboo. But as you can see, the, the first string wasn't mutated and then again, camel case it. Um, so the way that these fluent interfaces have been built up in, in Laravel is actually really good. Um, and it's the same for collections. You're using immutability um, and returning a copy of the data rather than mutating state, which again, I think is just a great advancement in, in PHP. Um, so I think everyone, yeah, should reach for these. They're just really helpful helpers. Um, so I pretty much just covered everything in this slide. Um, other than the last thing, that there is some advancements in, in the opcache and um, in the actual PHP engine towards um, improving that layer for, for um, immutability, where if it can actually understand that that data hasn't changed, um, then it will reuse that memory. But as far as I understand it, you actually can't be using any variables inside the array. Otherwise, 
It won't do it, but if you have a fixed array, then it will. But I struggle to feel, think of the time when that's useful, but um, there must be a reason they put it in there. If anyone can answer that, then let me know. So other things that we have in um, functional programming is uh, composition and piping. Um, which is essentially a way of, of composing functions together um, to build more complex logic out of uh, smaller discrete functions. Um, so in terms of PHP, how, how we could do this is in object orientation is uh, favoring um, composition over inheritance, um, but also use of a fluent interface and static methods for construction, much like in, in the Laravel um, classes we just looked at. Um, so I've got an example of using the Fluent interface, but I didn't think it was worth kind of going into composition of services because I think that's, that's probably something that's been covered a million times. Um, so I thought we'd just look at a few different examples um, for this. Uh, so this is uh, an example in JavaScript using Ramda and Compose. So I thought we'd use Compose here and everything else uses Pipe. Um, so this is essentially read um, bottom to top when you're using Compose and Ramda. Um, so we're passing this, this string of data in, which is essentially um, the, the current orientation of the um, robot. So, and the start, this is the grid that it's on. This is its orientation, and this is just a set of moves. Um, and this is just taken from a project I did a while back for fun. Um, so essentially just to, to clean the string up and get it into a usable state, we're trimming the string in case it's wrong, um, replacing any characters we don't care about, and then splitting it and then deconstructing it um, into these four variables. So as you can see, you can, you can quite quickly build something more complex out of small functions, and you could save this um, the output of this compose um, to um, a variable or you could have it exported from a file um, and reuse it. So um, that's basically how you can compose things together. Um, in functional programming languages you might see something more like this, the pipe operator, um, rather than that compose function, which I believe is coming to JavaScript sometime soon or is already available, someone might know. I'm not sure. Talking about it. Yeah, talking about it. I hope so. I'd, I'd be pro. Um, so yeah, this is Elixir again. Um, very much uh, uses the pipe operator within the pipe operator in, in Elixir. The, the last, the output of the last function gets passed in as the first argument. Um, so here is just just the variable that will get passed into trim, which will then get passed in as the last argument to replace. And then what you receive from replace is the first argument of split. So I think it's just a really clear way of, of seeing what's going on without these intermediate variables, um, where again, you kind of have to have that cognitive load of what, what do all of these do? What, why has someone named it this? Um, and every time you see this, you just, over time, it just becomes very clear. And the other way you see this done is it's kind of that nested, um, set of functions where you've got to start thinking about this is getting passed in here and this executes first. So for me, whether it's the compose going from bottom to top or I prefer the pipe personally because it's just kind of the way you've always read code, reading it upside down, that takes a little bit of getting used to. Um, but again, started thinking about this in, in PHP and, and really this to me is pretty much the same. Um, You've got this fluid interface, and it really just feels like like you're composing the functions together. You've got a class um, which is helping you to do that, um, but the only difference here is it's not quite as flexible because it has to be a function on on this class. So, with um, composing functions, you could be mixing promises and arrays and um, integers, whatever you expect to be passed on from the function before. Um, 
that you're expecting in the next one, you can receive that. Whereas here, if, if you all of a sudden have um, something that is outside of, of what's available to you, then you just can't really continue that chain. Um, but still super powerful. And I didn't actually check, but I wonder if it does return a Laravel collection rather than an array. Uh, and then you could continue on as a collection, but I, I haven't actually checked if that is the case. I think it returns an array though. And I think you can only do this in certain versions of Laravel. I'm pretty sure back in sort of five that this isn't quite the same. So if you are stuck on that version, then you might not be able to do this. Um, so moving on, talk about higher order functions, um, which when I first started learning uh, functional programming was quite a scary uh, set of words. I did not have a clue what that meant personally, uh, but then I quickly realized it was just something I already knew. So it's just any function that returns another function or takes one or more functions as an argument. It's quite a simple topic with a very confusing name in my opinion, which is possibly one of my things that I dislike about functional programming. Sometimes it's just, it seems like things are overly complicated and you could just say something very simple that everyone understood. Um, so um, this is a way again that in functional programming you can build up something very complex from small functions um, and at its simplest form, you could do something like a factory with higher order functions and return return another function in a factory. And I think probably people have done that in JavaScript quite a lot. It's quite a common pattern that you get a function setting something up and returning uh, before there was classes, especially um, unless you're someone that writes a lot in functional a functional way in JavaScript as well. Um, so taking a look at that um, in PHP. This looks pretty crazy. I was trying to get in as much as I could into one slide. Um, so essentially, you can pretty much do all of this in PHP. Um, you've been able to do this pretty much forever. It's just incorporating it into something that's object oriented. It doesn't always seem like like there's a way. Um, but I thought I'd go through through what you can do anyway, in case um, people hadn't seen it. Um, so. Uh, functions in, in PHP are first class citizens, so they can be assigned to a variable uh, to be used later, um, which is really important for higher order functions. It's the precursor to higher order functions. You pretty much can't do it. If you can't do this, you're not going to be able to uh, have higher order functions usually. Um, so we have yeah a factory for this, this function, and we have uh, a move of one. Um, and this is just to illustrate that in um, array functions in, in PHP since 7.4, um, rather than uh, with anonymous functions, you had to use use use. Um, the actual outside scope is available directly. Um, so here we assign move one, and we use it here at the end, um, and have some nested function calls. Uh, just to show that you can actually return a function from a function. Um, we then call call that function with our robot. So that, that sets up um, basically this part of the function is now available to return. So that's the kind of thing you often do in functional programming. Um, you're, you're partially applying a function and storing that scope for, for use later. Um, and I think this, this kind of pattern can be really helpful for things like when you're using um, design patterns like bridge pattern and factories. Um, the one problem with functions like this is quite often in factories, you end up not being able to cache your um, config. If it, say you're using a, D, a DI layer, then this is often a problem. Although the way Laravel does it, I don't think it is. So that's a bonus for that one. Um, so yeah, essentially we then have um, our function call here, which returns that, that move one. And we can then set up the, the direction. So that's then partially applied it and returned our, our final function um, and then the result. And as you can see, not that I put the output there, but the output was three. 
Um, so it actually held this scope within this function, even though it's used in, in the scope down here, which is actually uh, pretty cool, actually. I, I haven't personally used arrow functions enough in PHP. Uh, they just sort of pass me by. Um, I think because they have to be so small and you can't have like multi-line functions and you can't mutate um, any argument you pass in, it can't actually be mutated. So that returns a notice if you do try and do that. So they have their limited use. But in those certain scenarios, I think, say, array map potentially, that just make them much shorter than um, using anonymous functions. And that's the main bit that's uh, not about object orientation there. Um, so yeah, another great thing um, that I learned from um, using Elixir mainly is this idea of um, deferring side effects till the last minute and try not to couple your, your logic with your um, side effects. So here we're talking about side effects such as network, disk, and, and database calls. But I think um, this could be taken as far as mutating state, but that's probably not relevant for this talk because it's kind of impossible. In PHP, for the most part, you're going to be mutating state a lot. It's an object-oriented language, so it, that bit doesn't apply as much. Um, so the bits I'm really thinking about that you can take away from this is is yeah the network, the disk, and the database, and, and where you, you choose to do that. So, for example, um, if you're using active record models, then using these in the controller, all of a sudden you, your side effects are, are in there. If you're calling an external state, you're doing that in the controller, it's making it a lot less testable. Um, so there's, I told you that coffee machine would make that noise during this talk, and it did. I hate it every time we have a talk. Um, so that's really distracted me. Um, so yeah, this make, makes code uh, more testable, easier to maintain. And um, if you use these patterns, it will often um, lead to um, following the solid principles, um, such as open closed principle. Um, so yeah, my suggestions here are, are being declarative and using a service layer and, and trying to use patterns like um, the bridge pattern, or you could also use, even use events and, and farm that off completely. So your, your side effect is, is not even in that process. It's, it's just somewhere completely different. Um, so we should have some examples. Yeah, so this is quite a contrived example. Again, there probably probably be more in this service than, than I've got here. But um, again, for space reasons, um, it's quite simple. So basically, you're getting a PDF and then just um, writing it to disk directly, which is basically making this a lot less, a lot less testable. And um, this is also going to be slow in your tests, and it has to be to this disk. Um, so we start thinking about being more more declarative with that, um, and using um, something like a file system class, which receives an adapter. Um, or a bridge, um, and then deferring everything, even as far as not even the service, but another layer down where that can be swapped out. And then your calling class, it, it really knows nothing about what you're doing here. You're just declaring, oh, I want to write here. And that side effect is just completely removed from, from this code, which I suspect is probably a way that a lot of people are are writing now, but again, this is this is just something that um, solidified in my head as a, a great way of working from working in a functional in a functional way. So lenses, this is an interesting one. Um, I thought I'd include this just for completeness. Um, in object orientation, this is pretty much just a class with getters and setters, but you don't really have this. Um, in functional programming, there's, there's no way to do that. So um, it's essentially a way of encapsulating that logic to get or set something within a function that you can reuse across, across your code base rather than, say, in JavaScript, having these nested calls um, to set or get something that you, you then spread across your whole code base. You can use a, a lens which you apply everywhere in that code to um, to either set or get on that, that object. Um, so yeah, as I say, in, in PHP, it's pretty much just, 
just accessors, but it's just kind of interesting to think about. Um, so if you did happen to have a reason that, that you do need to use arrays a lot in PHP, then, then you could encapsulate that getting and setting within, within a class um, if you so needed to. But that's essentially the pattern that you'd get in, in functional programming languages to, to either set on, uh, on a map, um, essentially. Um, but as I say, you, you probably just do this. That's, that's probably what everyone is used to, and then hydrate this um, or extract from it with a, with a hydrator class if you needed to do anything like that. But yeah, I thought I'd just include that as a, a little interesting uh, difference between the two, essentially. Um, so partials and currying, um, we've kind of touched on this in PHP already in terms of partials, when we're looking at those higher order functions, um, we're partially applying functions by having uh, arrow functions that return other functions. So that's one way you can do partials. Um, but if you're using currying as well, you're essentially um, providing a function that when you call it with one argument, it will return a partially applied function. So you don't have to do any of this nesting, you just have, have a function that you can provide um, any amount of arguments to up to the amount that it um, takes it in its actual uh, signature. And until that final argument is taken, it will return this partially applied function. Um, so yeah, we can take a look at that. So again, here we have some code, uh, which is again, Ramda, it's very similar to what we looked at before, um, but split out. Um, so that you can see the, the partial application more. Um, so here we've got our split function and we're providing it with a, a space in a, as a string. And we can set that to a, a variable of split on space. Same with our, our bit of regex to replace on, we can create this function and then we can use them later on and they're partially applied because in Ramda, everything is partially applied by default, or is carried by default, so you can partially apply it this way. Um, and yeah, just to show you that, this is, is the output um, of that in the end. And this, again, wouldn't mutate any state here. Um, so yeah, just going back to that um, bit of code we looked at before, this is really the only way I can think about it being applied to PHP is if you nest calls like this um, and have arrow functions that return functions, then you can have something you know you, you can partially apply. But the problem with this is that if you don't want to use it that way, you have to call it multiple times. Whereas if it's curried, then you can give it any number of arguments and use it very flexibly because you, if you provide all the arguments, it's going to give you the result and one, you'll get the partial application, um, which as far as I know, there's no way of doing that in, in PHP at the moment, but that'd be super cool, I think, if you could. Um, I'm sure someone's written some crazy library, but probably shouldn't use that. So the last topic we're going to talk about is um, the idea of maybe. Um, so it's essentially a container, um, which may or may not um, have a value set. So um, something where you don't know if it's null or, or it's a string, say, um, which is quite common in um, functional programming languages, especially strict ones, because you you can't actually prov actually return null, so um, you'd have to return a type in some of them, and, and that's kind of where this idea comes from. Um, but I think you can apply this to PHP as well, so. I can't remember what version of PHP it was, but when um, return types were introduced, as far as I remember, you, you couldn't actually return null. Um, you couldn't do the question mark. I believe it was like 7.1, maybe they changed it to 7.2, somewhere around there. Um, so this is the sort of pattern you could have used then to get around that um, by actually having a class that you returned that encapsulates that concept of nothing and then you can type into your, your 
wrap a class all the way through. Um, but I still think this could be quite an interesting pattern to use, even though you can uh, specify null and the type you're expecting. Uh, this can be quite handy to just have more of a, a concrete interface. That doesn't really make sense, but an interface that you're um, that you can use all the way up of a calling stack. So if you wanted to defer your error handling, say on null, all the way up to your controller and you're quite deep down in the service layer, then rather than constantly saying this can be null when you wouldn't really know, is it null because of what I'm expecting or, or something else? Here, that is only where you, you set out that it could be null, that that can be null and all the way up, you can actually return and type hint on on this wrapping class and then defer this understanding of being nullable to the last minute. So I think it's actually still quite an interesting pattern that you could use, um, even though obviously you don't have to now. Um, and another way I was thinking about this is this idea of having an interface um, and then using the actual um, sort of null, nullable class pattern. So having a, a class which is actually null, which later on you can you can check this type if it is this interface or this this concrete, sorry, then then you can do error handling there based on if you've actually received this class um, that is the null version of what you're expecting of that interface. I think that's a, another way you could potentially um, implement this in PHP um, and explore that that idea of maybe having something that maybe nothing. Um, and that, that's pretty much all the topics I was going to cover today. I thought about covering recursion, but I thought that would just blow my mind at this time. Uh, so uh, does anyone have any questions? I feel like that's a no. <laughs> oh, we do. Maybe related or not. Uh, does PHP have a sync away concept? Um, I don't believe it does out of the box, but there's React PHP, which they may or may not have changed the name of since React uh, JS came along. I think they were thinking about it. But yeah, React PHP, you can start doing um, uh, asynchronous programming and it, it calls down to event lib uh, or two other uh, libraries that you can set it up with. Uh, I think it's production ready now. Uh, I have used it previously when it wasn't production ready. And that was interesting, but uh, it, it's pretty cool. But uh, I would personally say, having tried to use it, that yeah, using a language where where it's baked in is is a lot more preferable because um, we ran into some pretty big problems um, trying to use it. Um, yeah. Any others? I feel like that's a no. Thank you.